All right. Guys, let's call the uh, call the meeting to order. It is at uh, 1202, and let the minutes show that we do have a quorum of board members. Okay. All right. Um, just to let everybody know is that as soon as we uh, swear in uh, Dr. Olivera Ortiz is that she'll come up here and then I will go eat another fajita. So, if everybody will stand for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Moving down to item number three, which is the swearing in of the new board member. You'll raise your right hand and read your first statement. I, Jenny Navalvieras Ortiz, do solemnly swear that I have not directly or indirectly paid, offered, promised to pay, contributed, or promised to contribute any money or thing of value or promise any public office or employment for the giving or withholding of a vote at the election I was elected or as a reward to secure my appointment or confirmation, whichever the case may be, so help me God. Thank you. Next, raise your right hand, take your oath of office. In the name and by the authority of the state of Texas, I, Janino Iberas Ortiz, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the duties of the office of the University of Tyler Innovation Academy board member of the state of Texas. I will do my best and my ability, the best of my ability to serve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States and of this state, so help me God. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome out here. So, just quickly, uh, guys, this is Janita Oliver Ortiz from the Department of Educational Leadership. Um, and so, you guys want to remember, but I'm going to go down. Mr. Rodriguez, the one that's signing right there, is the uh, Palestine, correct? Yes. Palestine uh, representative. Uh, Mr. Aldridge, right there, is the Longview representative, parent representative. Uh, Dr. Lamb, of course, you know, and Mr. Humphreys is the Tyler representative. Uh, absent is uh, Frank Dox and uh, Michael Odell. So. Thank you. All right. Okay. You ready? Yep. So we're going to move on to the action items, and we have um, the consent agenda. We have the previous minutes from Thursday, July 14th, 2016. You received them. Um, you had a chance to hopefully review them. Any questions? Do mm -hmm. we have a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Um, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Mm -hmm. Opposed? The motion carries. Moving to the next uh, item is recommend adoption of the 2016-17 student code of conduct. So board members, each year we update our student code of conduct. As we have mentioned, um, we work closely with the Texas um, Charter School Association and um, we receive a template from them. And so the template is aligned with um, and updated each year with the law as well as with charter law. And so we're able to take that template, go in and modify it, tweak it, um, and update it each year. So the board um, is required to um, 
approve the student code of conduct each year. The code of conduct it will be posted on the website. It will be made available to parents. Um, if a parent requests a copy, we will provide them a copy. Parents are aware of where it has, um, where it's available. Um, principals have copies of the code of conduct um, as a reference that they refer to. Um, code of conduct speaks mostly to behaviors. So if a student does X, then the code of conduct will state exactly what the school's action is regarding the behavior. Sometimes the action um, that the school takes in, is a required action. Sometimes there is some um, opportunity leeway for the school to make the decision on what action to take, just depending on the, the actual action. Any questions on the code of conduct? Do we have a motion to accept the recommended adoption? I'll make that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second this. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? The motion carries. Next item is the recommended addendum to the special education model policies. At this time, I'm going to uh, turn this over to our director of special education, Sammy Broussard. Sammy's going to talk to you. She was here at our last meeting sharing with you about our policies. And so she has um, joined us again um, to um, provide us a few updates and recommend an amendment. So um, there were three policies that were not in the last set. Uh, TCSA did not have a document supplement policy ready to go at the time of our last one. They have it now, and so we have to address that policy. The other two, we had, I had originally pulled them out because there's a lot of pre-kindergarten language in them. Um, and Dr. Simmons has recommended that we go ahead and put them back in due to the fact that we will have five-year-olds uh, to get the kindergarten um, program up early next year if we plan to. And I just didn't, it was just a mistake. I left them out accidentally. So we do need to approve those three in order to get all of our policies up to date on the legal framework. And so it's just those three policies. I believe you guys have already gotten a copy of them. Are there any questions? <laughs> okay. Do we have a motion to accept the policies? Make a motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. And we're moving to the informational items to Dr. Um, Simmons' report. All right, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, we have several items here that we're going to discuss. Um, the first report is the first item, um, as the board has um, is aware. We got a superior rating, which we're very proud of. Um, and um, so that's the highest rating that a school district can receive. And so I just want to send a shout out um, to um, Chestnut and Cryer and Parkerson. Worked very closely with uh, Texas Charter School and TEA to ensure, um, and uh, also the university as well. Um, Jamie, you were mentioning, um, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Berger us guidance. As well. So, yes, and they helped us tremendously with the TRS. Um, piece this year for that Gatsby. And that was new, yeah. Yes, so, so, really <laughs> so this team of um, individuals celebrated when our superior rating came out because of the time and effort that they've put in it. Um, and so a shout out to um, to them for their hard work and effort. So, we um, deemed, um, go ahead. The area where we were actually received points deducted was an area where we really have no control. It had to do with the um, operational cost, the, the operation for what is this? Three months or six month operating costs on hand, um, and that's being appealed by multiple university charters because it's something that we really can't control. But all other aspects, we received all of the points who were not deducted, so we wouldn't have received a perfect score if it weren't for that one. And again, that's something that's out of our control. And I know that there are key individuals that are working with TA and Texas Charter School Association. I know Texas Charter School Association legal has gotten involved to support the charter schools and to talk with TEA. Because sometimes, as we have mentioned numerous times, sometimes there are laws that go into effect that we think that are good for everybody. And we don't realize that some people, um, they're, they're unable to comply with those because of the umbrella they're in. Um, and so 
I'm real excited to, to hopefully um, find that I think that's going to be something that's going to be amended for the, um, next year. So um, you guys will start working on this year's, right? Yeah, November. <laughs> that's what I thought. End of October. So <laughs> they have a little break. They actually find a lot. They, find, they get their rating, and then all of a sudden they start back on um, 2016. So, again, very excited about that. Congratulations. Thank you for your hard work and efforts that you put in. Thank you to the university um, for their support as well. Um, the next item, uh, any questions first, board members? Many of you were sitting when we did not receive a, a <laughs> superior rating and had to make those adjustments. So you, I know you're just as pleased as I am to know that um, we are currently in a situation where financially um, we um, are doing very well. So. Budget updates for 2016, Chestnut. Um, what you have in front of you with the green lines, the spreadsheet green lines, is the budget update as of June 30th, and it includes all the amendments up to that date. Um, and then our revenue for the year is at the bottom, our expenditure is at the bottom of the spreadsheet. Any questions? Oh, yes, the last column on the bottom, the revenue, that is not our expected revenue, uh, probably over to the next fiscal year. We will have that um, ready when we close um, the end of the year for y'all, with that information. Today is the first day of the new fiscal year, by the way, so <coughs> yesterday ended the fiscal year, and so now that everything starts closing out, we'll start looking at what we expect to roll over. Any questions? The next item is district enrollment. I'll give you a chance. Um, it's kind of towards the back of your packet. If you look at the longer legal sheets, it's two pages um, in front of those. If you'll uh, turn to the um, enrollment. Um, as the board is aware, we currently serve third through 10th grade students. Um, I think that someone did mention that um, we are looking and considering um, K through second. That will be something that we will have to have a conversation with um, TA and Texas Charter School. Um, we are coming upon our renewal this year, so we will actually have to submit our renewal, and in the event that we choose to want to add those K, that K through second, that will all be addressed in our renewal. Um, and so then, you know, the question comes to about if, you know, are we going to look at it for every campus, or are we just going to look at it for one campus? And then also, as you are aware, um, facilities um, is, a, is a, even a bigger um, issue that we have to address when we look at adding those younger students. So definitely something we are discussing and um, a exciting opportunity for us. We just want to make sure that we um, implement it uh, and monitor it closely and that the timing is right. So currently we do serve third through 10th grade students. Um, as you can see, the enrollment in each one of those grades. Um, Tyler currently has 263 students. Longview has 189 students. Palestine, 206. So we have a total of 658 students. Um, very proud of the efforts that um, took place um, on the campuses to monitor numbers throughout the summer. I want to send a shout out to the ladies that are not here, our admins on each campus, our directors, closely, closely monitored the um, um, admissions process and enrollment and acceptance process and so um, by doing that and staying in contact with families I'm proud to say that um, on the first day of school which August the 22nd we were about 12 students short of our number district-wide so we anticipated that this many students were going to show up and we actually were only 12 students short some of those students were sick some of those students did decide to go elsewhere that happens um, but I will tell you there was a time when we were short um, a lot more students because of the steps and systems we did not put in place. And um, as a board, you're aware that that student count determines who we hire, it determines it drives our budget. So when you're off 50 and 60 students, um, that's, that's several teacher salaries. That's a, a lot of resources on these campuses that they had needed and planned for that you can no longer purchase. So um, very excited about where we are. We do have have a few parades that have waiting lists. 
Um, and we do still have our accepting students. As you know, as an open enrollment charter, we accept students throughout the entire year, no matter if it's the last day of school, if we have availability. Um, so again, very excited about this opportunity. Uh, numbers continue to increase. I will, um, as I noted, I think in the previous board meeting, but now I actually have the data to support it. We had a higher percentage of return students this school year, as well as teacher retention in, than ever in the history of the school. Now that, should, that speaks volumes. When your students are, um, returning and now their their brothers and sisters are now enrolling and um, also your staff is is as returning and staying committed um, we are just in such a better place as you can hear in my voice I mean I'm so excited about um, what all we are doing and the position that we are in um, it, it's it's very exciting and so um, looking forward to it continuing to grow um, if I recall, our budget was built off of, of 650, so we are currently in a good position with 658. You know, so uh, we'll continue to hope to grow that number. Any questions? Um, also, I did not address. As you can see, attendance rate is high. I know that's just the first couple weeks, but you know, last year we did maintain a higher attendance rate on each campus and the district than we had in the past. So. Um, you know, we're going to continue to monitor that as well, and that's all to uh, speaks volumes to the leadership on those campuses and the admins working extremely closely with parents and the systems we put in to hold people accountable. That you know, you can't just come when you want to come. Um, you, it, it's a requirement, and communicating those requirements up front. Any questions regarding the enrollment? Where would you see twenty-five in the charts or? those classes those okay good point um great conversations because in the past what we have found we have overbooked like the um as dr odell has mentioned like that um airlines and we have booked and accepted up to 25 and in the first day we have 18 or 19 which is a good number um i will tell you this year our numbers were strong and so we do have a few classes that are at 25 um, where we accepted 25 that was our cap and all 25 have showed up um, and so you know we're monitoring that we have um, we've talked about that um, and looked at it we've looked at some of these classes do have um, additional staff members in those classrooms not all of them um, and so I think it's just something we have to closely monitor I will tell you um, for next year we will probably only book up to 22 um, it's just you know we have you, you've got to learn and at, we were we've never been in this position it's a good position to be in but we have truly never been in this position um, and if you look at history history we lose a few students those first six weeks um, and I can only speak to you know every reason from you know the drive is just further than we expected we're having to get up too early to parents move you know the thing about our system is is when a parent moves we usually don't have somebody moving into the community that's zoned to go to our school a traditional ISD the house that the parents move out of the house the family moves out of the house the house goes up for rent anybody that moves in there with kids likely is going to then go into that school guys when our kids move we likely don't fill that house with it's a it's a, a gamble whether that kids going to actually go to us there's so many opportunities for them to other places so um, you know I would like to say this number is only going to go up but we just have to closely monitor it because it just happens families move and um, people change um, you know uh, uh, school so um, but uh, we have looked at some of these classes um, and definitely on the Palestine campus I will tell you um, they were like one or two students off from their number um, and so we know that going into the future we've already talked about that at the cabinet level 22 is probably going to be our cap now to speak to it we will cap it now at 22 so um, if a student leaves and we have a waiting list, we will not be inviting another student into that 25. 25 will be that cap. So we're, we're looking to push it back to around 22, 21, 22 max now, if, if we do have some um, that withdrawal. So is the 25 the 
number that the charter put on the like that's the actual charter no. or, because the state is 22 yes the, um, the charter is written differently in fact we pulled that up this week because we had a question mm -hmm. about it because there is a, a regulation of 22 mm -hmm. but we did contact legal and that is not um, does not fall under the charter school requirement and um, so we're, we're looking at the wording because our wording is very different than saying that it has to be a, a one to, to 20 something ratio or 19 or 18. In the thing of how do they figure ratio? Because if you take all your certified teachers divided by uh, the number of kids in our schools, then we're at like a 17 to one ratio. Or do they actually look at that ratio as here's a teacher in this class and that teacher is serving 25 kids so if the charter says 22 so that's things that we're asking especially now that we're going forward with um, uh, renewing our charter that's the opportunity to, to tweak those things a little bit um, and learn from those um, we do have a lot of um, terrestrial teachers as you know uh, um, we've got the we're working with dr odell and his team um, we got the grant and so the residence teachers is what we call them um, basically um, that are also supporting our teachers as well so um, and you could think of as like a student teacher but most of them have already have a cert already have a degree and now they're seeking to be certified in education so we have um how many do we have on the tyler campus and so in some of those classrooms, that means that the teacher um, that has been here at the IA is now have, has support by one of those teachers. Now, in some of the, the situations that that teacher is actually the teacher of record um, because they are actually certified. So it just depends on their certification. So I think we have how many in Palestine residents? One. Okay. So you have two and then you have two. Um, so it's a it's a grant that was funded and it's an opportunity to have more bodies on campus but also really to have professional individuals that are, have, have um, degrees so so when you if you pull into that account then we are much lower than that 1 to 16 so um, that's kind of where we're at with that with the ratio any other questions regarding um, the, the enrollment and campus enrollment Okay, before we go to STAR data, I'm going to briefly speak to the student handbook and the staff handbook. Um, we sent you um, copies, board members of each one of those, just as a reference for you in the event you have, if someone, in, a parent asks you about those mm -hmm. specific things, please note the student handbook is posted. The handbook is not required for the board to approve because the handbook can be um, edited. And so in the event that we look at a situation that we need to tweak, um, you can do that by law and as long as you communicate that out to parents. It doesn't have to have board approval. Um, and then also your um, staff handbook. Um, we have worked closely with the university to align our policies um, with the university policies. Um, all of our staff, um, Ms. Cryer had an opportunity to, to meet with all the staff and go through the staff handbook. So um, it's a reference for them on how to, you know, if I'm going to seek travel or if I'm going to um, request a substitute or what are the rules regarding ethics and things like that within my profession so um, something that they can refer to as well so all of these things are posted on our website they are up to updated you have the most updated copy as well um, so I'm really pleased at the efforts that have gone in to um, create these documents and it just it makes everything a lot cleaner as you know when you can sit down with a parent that's upset about a situation or they want some clarification on a situation and you're not just pulling it out of um, the hat you've got something that you can reference it just makes things a lot cleaner same thing with employees you know people nobody wants to be in a situation where they're the um, they're the unknown and so I think that we've done a great job as an organization of really cleaning up those things so that um, it is a little more black and white um, when, when dealing with some situations. Um, so the next item that we're going to go to um, is our STAR data, and I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Weaver. But before I do, I just want to say I am extremely pleased um, with our data. Um, all the district met standard, which is the highest rating that a district can receive, and all three campuses met standard. So this will be the first year moving forward that you know we are sitting in a much better position um, 
as a district, not only financially, but also academically. So Mr. Weaver has spent countless hours breaking the numbers down um, and by campuses. We actually have a leadership retreat coming up that we're going to explore and dig deeper into these numbers. Teachers have seen this data all the way down to the student level um, ever since we received it. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Weaver so he can kind of walk us through um, our success. Okay. Hopefully, we've got two uh, documents to refer to, and we want to refer to this. Look at this, he put together. Simple chart. Um, and reported to you last time of the anticipated scores. Um, because I think it's pretty fascinating to you no longer be just concerned about meeting the minimum standard. We wanted to take this up a notch, as you all have mentioned also, and say, what does this really do for you? How do you rank with other schools? Let's not just talk about did we make it. Let's see how we're doing in relation to uh, other places. So this chart's just been expanded by one column. Uh, so in index one, and remember that's just general passing, but the current phase in passing standard. So pretty low standard, really. But um, as a district, to just meet the standard, you have to have 60% passing. That's what that 60 is there for. And we had 85% passing, which, when compared to all schools in Region 7, puts us in the 96th percentile. And I, I will want to talk more about this in a minute, but I want to give some content. Um, and then look at each of the campuses below. They also had a 60% for a minimum standard. And you see the three different campuses. By coming in at what you normally see as an 82, an 86, and a 90, instead take it one more dimension and say, where is that rankings? It ranked the Tyler campus at the 79th percentile in Region 7. I will share other data we do in relation to the state and in relation to schools more like us. But uh, Longview in the 91st and Palestine in the 92nd. So if you're familiar with how to read it, we can look at each one. Index 2, I'll, I'll remind you, is about student growth. Uh, it have they met growth or exceeded growth expectations? Uh, it is not a percentage score, it's, just, it's a score. So a score of 41 for the district. The minimum score you had to meet was a 22. So what does a 41 do for you? So it's nice to know that puts you in the 90th percentile in Region 7. And then if you look at each of the schools in Region 7, they got stratified out to the 57th, 76th, and 84th percentile. Before I go any further, is there any questions on how, how we're looking at that? So index three, I'll remind you, I should have put it on there because uh, if you're not dealing with this all the time, you tend to forget. It's just about closing the gap. It's about economically disadvantaged kids and often one of your lowest or two lowest sub -pops. Um So in the district, we had the media score of 28 at the minimum. We got a 47, but again, what does that mean? When ranked with every single district in region seven, it puts us in the 96th percentile and the top. You know, 5%. And then look at the, just the campuses. <clears throat> Their scores, again, if you only saw the 38, the 51, and the 50, you, you would know you met the minimum standard of 30, but you wouldn't know what that meant above that qualitative is. Again, when you spread out from head to toe in Region 7, it puts the Tyler campus at the 46th and the Longview and Palestine campus at the 95th and 96th or something. And index four, the one we tend to really want to emphasize quite a bit, is college readiness, which just means are you at the have you passed at least two or two of your tests um, at the recommended passing rate? And this is a percentage, so we had forty nine percent. Again, is that good or bad? You only had to do thirteen to meet the minimum standard. It puts you in the eighty sixth percentile when compared to all the schools in Region Seven. And then you can see how the other three campuses set out there. So a uh, question came up over here because uh, they realized in index uh, four, um, the 13 up on the district standard, um, 
index four, when you have a full campus or a full district with uh, full high schools involved in the calculations, have a different standard because it involves um, other numbers about graduation rates and, and, and SAT scores and things like that. Until you get a full high school in place and move a year beyond it, really, to start collecting that data, all you look at is star passes. So uh, this only compares us you know, into schools that are like us in the sense that uh, there's about 100 of them that are multi-grade campuses that do not have a full high school, that do not have this extra component, okay? Um, so we can look deeper into that and compare ourselves to Pine Tree or anything like this because by when the full data comes out, which just recently came out, but to dig in and say, what did, you know, Tyler, uh, Rodney Lee and index four, what was their star passing rate? And just compare it just to that piece. But given the data we have right now, we could only compare it to schools. Now, uh, this next piece of paper, I, I don't mean to scare anybody, but obviously I, I get a little giddy over data and stuff. You think? <laughs> so, I but, actually pulled this up on my phone when you sent it, and I was like, what? What's he thinking? <laughs> but here's the, here's the purpose. It's awesome, but I think the hours you put. I, I chose to display the information on a thing called a histogram. And a box of whisper. A box of whisper, I mean. And because I think if you're familiar with it or become familiar with it, it's at a quick, at a glance, kind of get a sense of context. Even more than what we were just discussing. And so, what, what it means is, on index one, I know the print is kind of small, I did every, every uh, uh, district in the state, which there's a very small number there, there's about 1,200 of them, and every campus in the state, this is all published by the state, and just put it in spreadsheet, play, there's 7,500. You just line them up from top to bottom, and you put a red dot where the middle is, so you know exactly where the 50th percentile is. I put a blue, dark blue dot at the highest score that was scored out of any campus or district, and at the lowest score, so you know the complete range. That little blue section in the middle goes from the 25th percentile, the lower green dot, to the upper green dot, 75th percentile. <clears throat> so 50% of the state scores right inside that little blue bar. So now you can index by index get a visual picture of where your score put you. Uh, if you look at index one, compared to the state, it put us at the 88th percentile. Do you see the IA in the black box with the 88? Mm -hmm. But compared to region seven schools, that same score is the reason it's on the same level, put us in the 96th percentile. And according to what this multi-grade group that I was describing to you just a minute ago, which is just about 100 districts and 200 campuses, it put us in the 88 percentile. Now there is one other thing I threw on this. It's not normally on a, on a box of whisker. I put that yellow uh, box. The reason I put that is because I thought beforehand, if we had a discussion, we'd be more interested, where is the 90th percentile? We probably are gonna start setting goals, not to meet the minimum standard, not to be at the 50th percentile, but how do we get to the 90th percentile in every area? So for a quick, quick reference, that yellow box is at the 90th percentile. So you can see where Palestine is already at the 90th percentile in the state, at the 91st percentile, according to Region 7. According to a group of schools like our, uh, like our multi-grade, they're in the 84th. Can you tell us again what multi-grade? Uh, so, yeah, I know it is confusing. Uh, there are, let me say it this way by process of elimination, there are campuses that are pure elementary, and there's actually some districts that only have pure elementary, so there'd be an elementary district, elementary campus. There are some that are pure middle school, <coughs> middle school. There are some that are only high school. There are some that have the full range. But if you are multi-grade without a full high school, this is a subdivision in and of itself. So you have elementary, middle school, and a partial high school. Do you have the ends in there? No. 
Well, uh, yeah. how many? School said in the group. How many in multi-grade? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, I did. Yeah, he has it. I only referenced it on index one, and they're very, very small. So you see the very, very small numbers up there. That's 200. That's right. 200 and then 100 districts. That's right, 100 districts, 200 grades. That's across the state. That's across the state. And they, the other way, well, it gives you, you know, you just don't know what these numbers mean, and this gives you a visual way, and I, I think it's going to be used, uh, being used already as more of a planning tool for saying where do we want to be in this mix. We're no longer just trying to jump over the low fence. We want to, you know, we want to be, we need some targets. We need to know where that is. And what that means. So, quick question: Is this is the multi group? Um, is that this? Is that the subgroup that the state uses for the distinctions, or is that a smaller group? Very good question. No, the group for distinctions is strictly right. 40 schools, right. Right. and that's based on some demographic formulas. That, that, comes, out that comes out the 16th or uh, September. Yeah, yeah. 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 September. It'll, it'll be out in a little while, mm -hmm. and we'll see how we did for you based on those schools. Uh, this is the group. Just I didn't know. I didn't just make that group up. I just want right, you to right. know it is the group <laughs> that accountability. This set of standards applies only, only to this to group. Schools, yeah. There's a set of standards that only apply to what they call a, a, a multi hmm. without high school. So in the, the state defined it. The state, these are state defined, yes, by their standards. I was published in Index L. But uh, <laughs> you can tell Williams that numbers got I, me. He's eating this up. I, 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 um, I did want to one note. I was hoping a question would come up and someone would say, uh, well, you know, what about what about the Tyler campus? Well, what about the Tyler campus? Oh, thank you. Right. Um, and, if, and it's probably easier, I mean, you can either reference it on Instagram or reference it here. And I, I want to point out an example. I. I there's 51 pages of calculations that you need to do of our three campuses in our district. But for index four as an example, I didn't give you this in front of you, but if, if you'll give me for a second. In index four, that's how many of your kids were college ready, how many passed at least two courses, two tests at the recommended level, at a higher standard. And if you saw the numbers sitting in front of you, you'd see that Tyler, for all students, was 53%, Longview was 54%, Palestine 54 District 54. You hear all those? Right on the same line. All kids, 54, 53. But why is Tyler's score of 44 compared to Longview's 56 and Palestine's 54? Y'all follow me on that? Mm -hmm. The reason is the way the formula works. They don't just take all students. They take out any subgroup that you have at least 25 students in. So now you look at the all white students, and here's how the numbers come out 58, 57, 53, 56. You hear all those? I know it's kind of fast, but they're all 50. But 58 was Tyler, 57 was Longview, 53% was Palestine. So they're looking neck to neck. Then you get to the Hispanic population. There are 16 students on Longview campus, 15 students on the Palestine campus, and 37 on the Tyler campus. Out of those 37 students, only 22% met this, uh, this standard. Only 22% passed two or more of their tests at that recommended level. Well, they averaged together that 53, that 58, and that 22. This is a way of them giving uh, uh, subgroups equal weight. So uh, unlike other standards, standard one, they blend in. Standard four, they are a third, in this case, a third of the weight, even though there's only 37 students. They're a third of the weight of Tyler's score. Now, you can probably see right away what this begins to, you begin to ask yourself questions, and what are you doing there, what have you done there? You know who these, and yes, I know who these 37 kids are. They've been working with interventions with these 37 kids. They know that to raise that 30% means 11 of those kids. And that 11 of those kids are spread over seven grades, maybe two here, three there, one here. 
Is it a matter they begin to introspect and say, is this a matter of something falling through the cracks? Is this a matter of me not paying attention to this type of student? Is it a matter of my culture not taking care of this? Is it a matter of my intervention somehow? And in spite of that, do we do specific things to make sure we take care of that? The accountability system is made after index one. It's made for you to go, wait, am I catching every single soda? Whether you ask that out of the goodness of your heart or because accountability is stuck. And in Palestine and Longview, those Hispanic students did not have weight. They had weight. So right. weight. So they had because, they, two, because they did uh, not have 50, a group 50 of... 50-something and 50-something and giving their school. Tyler, who had the same 50-something and 50-something. Had to... And that's what the 37 about. involved in that, well, in all students. But because it becomes a subgroup, it now draws that kind of attention. Which again, from a state's point of view, is a good thing. They want to make sure you from a parents of every child. And from a parents' um, yes. standpoint. Yes. And it's a district, I mean, it's something we should be a doing. Very, I'm not going to try to go into it because it becomes a little bit of a, a, it gets a little convoluted, but index two and index three have their own formulas that create a similar weighting system to where we begin to look. You're doing similar, but how are you doing with these students? Here's an even better question. Just because those 16, 16 kids on the Longview campus and those 15 kids on the Palestine campus didn't show up in accountability, are you taking care of them? You understand what I'm saying? Just because they didn't show up there, those, those principals, those directors, those coaches are going, wait, let me make sure I am taking care of every way I slice this, economically disadvantaged, subgroups, and so we get to look at this data and dig into it and make plans accordingly. But I want to give you all an overview and a reference sheet for a sense. You could look at other schools and see their score and place them right on this chart, and you know where they where they fit. Also, you've had a chance to see that we have gone in and looked at counties. So you actually have county charts as well. So we have the Smith County chart, also Anderson and Gregg, as you know, that's the three counties that we're in. And we have actually compared our scores um, to the the county scores for those ISDs as well. One comment on that: we break it down by county, and then we're using like district score to do a comparison. Do y'all think it would be helpful if we looked at like our Longview campus? Have you seen these? Um, yeah, I just wanted to see if it was because I thought they had already done that. He did. Um, but <laughs> this it's our overall innovation academy, all three of our campuses together. That's the score. That's right. That's the district. But if we're breaking it down by county, it would be good for our Tyler to be in on a graph like this. Oh, like? Yeah. Oh, yes. I think what would happen is, though, you would you would have to, if you think about it, if you broke it down by campus, Tyler campus, then you would have to break it. You would have to all those campuses in Smith County. So you would like Tyler ISD. If, well, if you're comparing, we're, I mean, we're looking at yes, we are a district, but we're a district in three separate locations. And we're trying to look at those three separate locations. We want to see how our campuses are comparing in those locations because that's the culture that we're trying to compare it against. So mm -hmm. when, we, when we go Anderson County um, and we're looking at you know, Houston, uh, you know, we're, we're at the 85 of our. Of our um, our district kind of score. Mm -hmm. well, Housing's at 90. And then 41 for district, but Housing's at 45. I guess I'm still trying to figure out how to, John, how to do that because if you look at, if you look at our campus, we serve, like in Palestine, she serves third through 10th grade or ninth grade last year. If she was going to look at campuses that mirror her, she would there was no other yeah. campus that would match them and scored on the same scale so I, I i'm i see what you're saying but i'm just saying i don't think it's i don't think it's doable because if i told her okay i want you to go pick your top five schools that you compete with that we draw you know she couldn't do it because she couldn't compare them because they're all like i think of tyler isd well there's six elementaries so it would be you would have to break our elementary third through fifth. So there's all kind of those issues, but I, it seemed to me that these three documents were an attempt to look at um, innovation academy and 
an art campus mm -hmm. compared to a similar culture, meaning districts in a certain part of our state and the other county. Okay. And so you're trying to see how our sampling of kids that we pulled from that area, mm -hmm. how we instruct them are compared to mm -hmm. other campuses that instruct the same kids. That's mm -hmm. my that's what I get I can mean from these three documents. Okay. And so I don't think it would be any harm if we're sitting here saying our Palestinian campus, yeah, we can't find similar kind of um, we can't find similar schools, individual campuses, but let's just look how those districts are preparing kids in, in Anderson County, and then how is our Palestine campus um, educating our kids that are from Anderson County? And right now, I look at that and says we're at the top of it. You know, you line these up, we're doing right there, if not better than all of these. Correct. So I, I think that's great. That's really good. Really awesome. Then I go to Greg County. Okay. And I do the same thing. Um, and I'm making a long view campus and I'll put their scores against all these other districts in the Grand County. We're right there, top of the list, higher on most of them, except for four, but that's just because we don't have enough kind of students and grade levels. Mm -hmm. But then when I go to Smith County and I pull just title around, right instead of putting our district number, which puts us up at the top of our list, we mm -hmm. actually drop down. We're closer to where ARC is. We're closer to the numbers of ARC as opposed to the numbers up there with the window. And then if you look close to ARC is Cumberland Academy, which you would say is a very comparable campus here in Tyler. So we're right there, a little bit above, but when you just oh, I see what you're Tyler, saying when you're comparing just when we look just at Tyler numbers in Smith County and we put it in this, and we're not at the top, we're down in the middle. Okay. And so we are we're doing better than our rival, if you will, charter schools and down the road. Um, but we're, we're more like our ISD um, and how we're preparing kids. Uh, so instead of that line being the district data, I see what you're saying, compare these the same districts, but yeah. yeah. And so if you see and you look at Tyler and you think, hey, look, we're right up there, copying them, we line everybody up more people. Mm -hmm. Let's just look at Tyler because Tyler's the one in Smith County. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I just, that's, if I were, this is a data-driven decision. I think. Yes. If you look at data, this is a great graph. This, when I look at this graph, I see where we are, and I see Tyler campus is right there at the median. And I don't want Tyler to be at the median. I want Tyler to be higher than the median. So how do we get up? And we look at Palestine and Longview, and they're, they're at the whisker of the boxing whisker at the top part. So that's great. We can keep them there. This is good, data-driven decision. Here's where we are. It'd be awesome if you could do the same graph last year. See where we were last year, the year before, and then see how we're kind of making our way up this graph. That's what data-driven decision-making is about, and that's what this, my, my thinking of these three documents was an attempt to see our sampling of the culture of these counties that are in see, our yeah. classrooms. Good point. Doing. And um, I see that we're right up there at the top of the list in Anderson Gray County and in Smith County. We're, I mean, we're okay. I would, yeah. I'm not complaining, but we, it's a little misleading taking just the overall mm -hmm. number. And that's so, definitely. If you break up the math score, how do we compare to these other schools? Right. Yeah, we, and we, we go deeper into that. And, I mean, we can share that here. I mean, the, does that lower our. I mean, are we lower on the comparison on math compared to the... Right, it's a little different look, um, and uh, we can do that a couple different ways. I mean, we could bring back another report. Uh, they actually, the state now, the last two years, provide frequency tables for every subject, every grade level, and you place yourself right on that frequency table and see where, where, you, where you are. So we are STEM Academy. We are, and that, and that was, I mean, we talked about yes. it last board meeting a little bit. Okay. You know, the, you know, the math scores were lower generally than the reading scores and, and of course that's all amalgamated together in this index one right so right i'm curious so, how we compare to other schools yeah. on math since we are a stem school i need to be better at math than other schools so we we could pull together a chart mm -hmm. for the next board meeting to um to really look at those masks yes. and that's that what we will be doing as well as at our leadership mm -hmm. retreat um so yeah. I'm curious, when you look at these by county, we're really high on most everything, very low on index four. Is that because we don't have the upper grade savings test? 
happens on every county where we're not it's not calculated the same index four. index four you remember how we were talking about oh, okay. yes that's unfortunate because yeah, that's mixed in with schools that have scored it's impossible for us to get the the, the star it's score the only counts 25 percent of it so the until we get Thank graduates yeah and diplomas and yeah yeah that's it yeah that's true fair i mean just look at cumberland academy where they are on the same scale as us and they have 31 and get 44. But they only need to make first. Oh, it's by campus? We, we, we received the data from Brian, so he ran the data for us. Like, I have one for Anderson County with every campus in Anderson County, right. and it shows where we ran. Okay. So I, I know we have so many charts going right now. Um, Weaver, if you'll just make a note to send that out to, um, to the board or send it to Cryer, well, she'll forward it to the board. How many, how many rank this well, all elementaries and middle schools will have the 13 target because they don't have graduation rates, they don't have diploma rates, so we'll, we'll be compared to, yeah. Yeah, not specifically the 13, just to be clear. Uh, if you're just an elementary campus, your target is 12. If you're just a middle school campus, your target is 13. If you're just, uh, uh, if you're a district, though, those are campuses. If you're a district, your target is 13. Um, if you're a multi-grade, uh, yeah, there are so many different standards written on here. Today. But the, the multi-grade uh, subgroup that I made, that I used on the, on the uh, box and whisker, mm -hmm. uh, is all of those schools that got rated by the exact same set of standards we were, as a district or as a So that puts us that's as similar as a group of, group, group of campuses to us. It's just, we're going to have that parsing mm -hmm. more. And then actually, is the one uh, option to speak to, but it, we have all our campuses within the upper level of four times. Yeah. And because I do always want to bring up when we're dealing with small numbers like this, it's percentages or one thing. Small numbers again. We are literally talking, and and index two, seven students would have flipped this would have flipped Tyler right up to the same as Tyler King on you. Index three, six students would have flipped it. Well, and we index never get small. Yeah, I mean, I mean one yeah. kid does flip yeah. one. Yeah, exactly. And you know, one thing um, too is that you have to look at too that um, let's take for example, um, Weaver was talking about the Hispanic student and then the, that student. You could take a Hispanic student and that Hispanic student we know counts in index one and that student counts for math, reading, writing. If they're in sitting in fourth grade, they count. So they count in all that same student if they're a fourth grader. You also go to index two, and if that Hispanic, if we have a Hispanic group there, 25, right, that student would count there. Also, if that student is ECD, they not only count as an ECD student, now they actually count as a Hispanic student. So this one student's test can count multiple times, multiple times in each index. Well, and we have, we have a, just to give you a specific situation, it kind of grew only and happened on one campus. Uh, we not only have a, lar a larger Hispanic population, uh, a larger number of those are ECD, mm -hmm. and a larger number of those are LEP. LEP was big enough to uh, count as a subgroup also, which in a different, in, in, in index two, uh, averaged twice. So you had a Hispanic score and an LEP score. And some of those were the oh, same kids. They were the same kids, and it drove the, that, that number down. So one of the initiatives that's already been taking place, one of the T res uh, residential teachers or some category related to that is serving, you know, multi, multiple service, teaching Spanish, serving just these LP kids so that we're making sure they're getting the right services through ESL. And, and some of them have, are also double coded in special ed. Special ed also counted for us on the Tyler campus in this too. Uh, so and not on the other two campuses. Not on the other two campuses. It's that Tyler will begin to get the subgroups, of course, mm -hmm. faster uh, than, than the other options. 
I hope, we say all this in contrast, I hope that we look at this data, but we don't, we don't make the data, or don't allow the data to cause us to treat the child with different threat. Right. Uh, Mr. Lawyer, uh, if you have limited efficiency children, right. then we need to have services for them. If you have um, students with special needs, then we have, need to have services for them. And uh, we have a, our child who's gifted and talented, we need to have services for them. Um, and so every child counts. And this is one metric that's out there that the state utilizes. And yeah, we have smaller ends. One, one data, one element in your sample is going to weigh more heavily than an element in somebody else's sample. But in the eyes of the child and the education, it, it, there's no difference between one to the other. And, and so I just, I hope that if, in data being communicated like this, that we don't establish a culture to where, um, oh no, I have another LAP kid. Um, <laughs> it doesn't need to be that way. He said, I have another child and I need to get this kid to get as high as he needs to get to or she needs to get to. I think what it does is it really pushes us to really reflect and to look at our practices and ask, okay, so how do we connect with those students to, within our model? Um, and I, I will speak to, um, that I think that the, to me the greatest reward that we're looking at is that our kids are engaged in meaningful learning and the scores are taking care of themselves that the, our model has not, we have not gone back to a very traditional direct teach, worksho worksheet driven, star driven model. We have embraced our model, tweaked it to ensure alignment um, and getting these the results um, at a higher level. And that is to me um, something to, to celebrate. And so, you know, our goal is right now is to begin to look at these areas that we're struggling in, to really dig into them and say, okay, so so what are we doing for these 25 students here and 16 students and 15 students? What, how do we look at our model to support those students and not put them in a room and say, now we're going to drill and kill you with worksheets to get you where we need you to be? Um, there's nobody in this room that supports that um, because we all, wait, we all go back to, well, that's, if we're going to do that, then we're no different. Um, guys, we're getting these students because of the success that we're having. Um, you know, and it, it's just an exciting time as well. So, um, but definitely we can share with you how we break down and compare within content areas as well. And so um, Weaver will get those to cry and cry and get those out. So um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Weaver. It, it serves as our um, district um, testing coordinator from everything to um, all three campuses to supporting them with all the star tests and getting all those things checks and balances and turned in. We did not have any um, issues this year on the campuses that required us to report um, any um, concerns. And so uh, a shout out to him on his the systems he's put in place to support these directors and teachers. To, um, and then also to take this data and really push us and, and um, to really reflect on what we're currently doing. And then, you know, our step is now we take this data and we say, okay, what can we do now and what's going to change within our practice? And who's going to evaluate that those changes are working? And what's it going to look like? And what resources do we need? And that's that's our job as leaders now. Um, and hopefully that we're going to get a, a, a return for our investment through this change that we're going to um, invest in. So again, exciting times um, on all three campuses and the district. And um, looking forward to just continuing um, to grow. Any questions? at this time for Weaver. All right, I think um, the last item is just administrative updates. We, um, just briefly, as you're aware, um, we are heading in, this is the second week of school. Um, all campuses have, um, it's really been a great start. I've had a chance to just um, briefly reflect with the directors prior to this meeting, and all three of them shared. Um, we They feel like we're just in much better position. I'm proud to say this is the first time in the history of the school that the same three directors have been in their positions, so that's going to allow us to grow. Um, again, teacher retention was high. 
um, then as well as student retention. Parents are excited. We have active PTOs on every campus. Um, we have scheduled a time within our master schedule on Wednesday afternoons. Some campuses are calling it um, um, innovative hour. Some are calling it wonderful Wednesdays, teen time. But basically, we've built in a little bit of time within our day um, on Wednesdays to do some really creative activities with kids, whether it's a, a, a book readathon or um, painting a canvas, um, robotics to everything to, you know, playing a volleyball game um, for the, that time. So, um, real excited, and it just depends on the grade level of how we're organizing those activities. Um, when and the students are engaged in those activities we are working with our content coaches are actually working with our teachers to support them um, and that's only on our Wednesday afternoon so our kids are really excited about it because they kind of get a chance to just step away and engage in some of the activities that we haven't had an opportunity to do because we are so content driven and time you know, um, not don't have a lot of additional time so um, tweaking those things um, we have how many students in dual credits Students taking dual credits. Um, what, that were TSI, and we did boot camps over the summer, so that number's only gone up. Um, so, what percent of our ninth graders? Like, what percent do you think our ninth graders are, are taking these dual credit classes? What percent of our tenth graders are taking dual credit classes? One of the all that we have is that we all. Yeah, one of them is hundred percent. So, yeah, 80, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, or higher. Um, and so those students that have not met the TSI already are getting um, additional support. Parents are really excited about the direction of the school. I actually have a, a meeting scheduled on each campus to do like a state of the district with parents just to share with them where we're currently at and our, um, our plans for growth. So, any other questions that the board may have or any other individuals? Okay, you want to make a motion to adjourn? Okay, um, we'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make that motion. And the time is 1.04. Okay, meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Car, do you need these as well? Weaver, would you hand that to her, please? And someone, would y'all turn that off? <laughs> Hey, thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Just tell me what I've always said on that side of the business.